Welcome back, everyone, to this 2021's first ever episode of Space This Week. Space This Week is your Monday rundown of all the best and latest news pertaining to space, spaceflight, and space history. And we've got quite the show lined up. Before we begin, if you're not already subscribed, then make sure you hit that button down below. It means that you'll get notified of these videos the second they're live, so that the news you receive is as up to date and relevant as possible, and not like three weeks late. But with that, let's move straight along to our first segment, all of the launches and events that we saw take place last week. Last week, we saw just the one launch, an Ariane space-operated Soyuz rocket, which launched from the French Guiana Space Center on the 29th of December. On board was a Composant Spatial Optique, which in English translates to Optical Space Component, which is a French military Earth observation satellite launched, somewhat unsurprisingly, on behalf of the French Armed Forces. The satellite is now comfortably sitting in low Earth orbit. The Soyuz launch aside, we also saw lots of cool developments down at the SpaceX Starship farm in Boca Chica, Texas. We were a little bit worried about the future of the SN9 after it fell over inside the high bay following a stand malfunction, which ended up dealing some damage to the vessel. However, thankfully it looks like the damage was very much repairable and the prototype is currently undergoing cryoproofing and RCS testing with static fire tests expected to begin this week and the vessel has the ultimate goal of conducting a similar flight plan to the late SN8, though with slightly less disassembly at the end, hopefully. The other prototypes saw both Starship and the Super Heavy booster continue to speed along construction, with the SN10 already looking very close to completion. We also learned that SpaceX planned to catch the Super Heavy booster using the launch tower. This is contrary to the initial expectation of it simply landing like a Falcon 9 or a Starship, and I can't wait to see how SpaceX managed to pull this one off. The community has already begun hypothesizing the ways in which this could be done. I personally really like Star Wars Dennis's suggestion, which he constructed using the highly realistic spaceflight simulation software, uh, Kabal Space Program. Maybe that's some software I'll have to check out in the future. It does look very interesting. But those were all the best space events that took place last week. So now let us look to the future at the launches expected to take place over the next seven days. The first launch of the week is expected to take place tomorrow on the 5th of January, and this will be a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, taking off from Cape Canaveral. On board is a TurkSat 5A, a Turkish communication satellite that, provided that the mission succeeds, will be placed in a geosynchronous Earth orbit. The satellite will be used for commercial and military purposes. This will be the fourth launch of this particular Falcon 9 first stage. Previously, it's launched a GPS-3 satellite and two Starlink batches. Hopefully this won't be its final flight though. SpaceX planned to land the first stage around 670 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. The fairings are also expected to be recovered using the fairing recovery vessels Mistree and Mischief. The next launch will be on Sunday the 10th of January, and this will be the air-launched rocket Launcher 1, which is operated by Virgin Orbit. This two-stage rocket is deployed by a modified 747 at high altitude, negating the need for a hefty first stage to power through the thickest part of the Earth's atmosphere. The Launcher 1's first ever flight was in May last year, but this unfortunately ended in disaster after a propellant line failed, leading to a loss of engine power. The cause of this issue has apparently now been addressed through strengthening of the components that failed, so hopefully this time the launch goes well. On board will be various American technology demonstration satellites, as well as a microgravity research satellite and an atmospheric research satellite. But the Launch 1 and the Falcon 9 are the only two launches planned to take place this week. So now let us move along to Space This Week's final segment, all the best historic space anniversaries that we can look forward to celebrating over the next seven days. <laughs> Our first series of anniversaries are today, January the 4th, the first of which is the 1958 Sputnik 1 re-entry from low Earth orbit. I don't think Sputnik 1 needs any introduction to this video's audience. It was the first ever artificial Earth satellite launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. 
The unanticipated success of the launch precipitated the Sputnik crisis in the United States and sparked the beginning of the space race. Sputnik 1 broadcast radio pulses from its four radio antennas during its first three weeks of orbit, after which its batteries ran out. It spent its remaining two months in space floating in silence before its orbit eventually decayed and it fell back into the atmosphere. Sputnik 1 is without doubt not only one of the most iconic and major spaceflight events, but also one of the biggest achievements in humankind's history. One year after Sputnik 1's re-entry, on January the 4th in 1959, another Soviet spacecraft made history. This time it would be Luna 1, which would be the first spacecraft to reach the vicinity of the moon. It was launched from Baikonur just two days earlier, and the original plan was to have the probe impact the moon, spending its time prior to crashing studying the lunar surface using its six onboard instruments. Unfortunately, Luna 1 overshot its target and missed the moon by around 6,000 kilometers. It was, however, still able to conduct lots of experiments, including measuring radiation levels in the Earth's radiation belt and the first ever direct measurements and observations of solar wind. One side effect of overshooting the moon was that the Luna 1 inadvertently became the first artificial object to reach the escape velocity of the Earth, and it remains in orbit around the Sun to this day, cruising between the orbits of Earth and Mars. And speaking of Mars, our third anniversary for January the 4th is the successful landing of NASA's Mars rover Spirit, which touched down on the Martian surface in 2004. Spirit was one of two rovers in NASA's Mars Mars Exploration rover mission, its twin adventurer Opportunity landed on the other side of the planet a few weeks later on January the 24th. Each rover bounced across the surface inside a landing vessel protected by airbags as Mars' atmosphere is too thin for sufficient descent slowdown with parachutes alone. After coming to a standstill, the airbags were deflated and the landing craft opened. The rovers rolled out to take some amazing panoramic images, which were then used to help scientists select promising geological targets for the rovers to investigate and conduct close-up scientific investigations. Spirit landed at Gusev Crater, a place where mineral deposits suggested that Mars had a wet history, while Opportunity landed at Meridiani Planum, a possible former lake in a giant impact crater. The two rovers were initially planned to explore Mars for 90 days, but both ended up exceeding this goal by several years. Spirit operated for six years in total, during which it would cover over 7.7 kilometers of driving across the Martian surface, far in excess of its planned 600 meters. The distance travelled allowed the rover to conduct an extensive geological analysis of Martian rocks and planetary surface features, and together with its twin, Opportunity, the two rovers made several significant discoveries, including evidence of previous saltwater presence on Mars, evidence that suggested that Mars' atmosphere was once much thicker and warmer, and signs that flowing water once existed on Mars as well. All of these findings, and more, indicated that Mars was once a much more hospitable place, and possibly a harbour of life. Spirit eventually became stuck in soft sand and was unable to free itself or sufficiently charge its batteries, and communication was lost in January 2010. Opportunity soldiered on alone for a further eight years, finally succumbing to Mars's hostile environment after a planet-wide dust storm covered the rover's solar panels, leaving it without power. The two rovers certainly left quite the legacy, and their mission of finding evidence for life on Mars will be continued by Perseverance, which as we speak is currently en route to Mars to continue the search for evidence of life. Here's hoping it has an even longer mission span than its predecessors. Our next anniversary is on January the 7th in 1610, when Galileo made his first observations of what would become known as the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto, Io and Europa, though he didn't fully distinguish Io and Europa until the following day. The Galilean moons are the largest moons of Jupiter, and each has its own fascinating properties. Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system, with a surface dominated by sulphur and lava. It sits in a slightly elliptical orbit, and Jupiter's immense gravity causes huge tides in Io's solid surface, which generates the enormous amounts of heat that give rise to its volcanic activity, which are driven by hot silicate magma. 
Contrary to Io's fiery world, Europa's surface is mostly water ice, covering what is believed to be a vast global water ocean. This makes Europa an incredibly interesting target for astrobiologists because of its potential for having a habitable ocean very much like the Earth's. Life forms have been found thriving near underwater volcanoes and other extreme locations on Earth, so it's not a stretch to imagine that similar life forms may exist on Europa as well. Ganymede is the largest moon of Jupiter, in fact it's the largest moon in the entire solar system, and it's even larger than the planet Mercury, although only at about half of its mass. It's the only moon to have its own internally generated magnetic field, and a saltwater ocean is believed to exist nearly 200 kilometers below its surface, sandwiched between layers of ice. The final Galilean moon is Callisto, second largest moon of Jupiter. Its surface is extremely heavily cratered and ancient, though when zoomed in at a small scale it actually has very few craters, suggesting that landslides have happened throughout its history and probably even occur today. But with the discovery of the four Galilean moons, I'm actually going to leave it there for this week's best historic anniversaries, which brings an end to this segment of the show. And that's it for another episode of Space This Week! I know, not a lot of launches taking place at the moment, but such is the way with the New Year season. I can promise you that this year will be a very exciting one though. We're expecting to see the first flight of a helicopter on an alien world, the landing of a Mars rover, and the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, which will replace the legendary Hubble Space Telescope. I can promise you to deliver news on all of these amazing missions and more over the course of the year in space this week, so make sure you've subscribed and I do hope you enjoy this journey as much as I will. If you want to see previous episodes of Space This Week, then there's now a link to the full playlist on the left-hand side of the screen, and on the right is a video from my channel that YouTube's recommendation elves think that you'll like. Hopefully they made a good pick. Everyone, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you all have an excellent new year.